We've got three local people giving, a, I think, a much more pragmatic and practical presentation. So the first one is from Alan and Lizette. They've been breeding belted Galloway cattle for 30 years. They've been using stud genetics and they believe in a paddock to plate approach to cattle breeding. Alan's been the chairperson of the Stud Beef Victorian Herald, Weekly Times Young Cattle Handlers Camp. And he's been involved with the Stock and Land Beef Week Field Days Committee. He is the vice, he's the current vice president of the Victorian Farmers Markets Association and he's got political ambition to become the president, and I'd like to support him in that. No, he doesn't. <laughs> yeah. And Alan also believes in the emergence of farmers' markets has had a huge impact on the farm effort in recognition and consumer awareness of product over the past few years. But just before I let him free to talk to you, I actually asked him about his values and what's important to him. And he looked at me and goes, well, my family, my family. I said, great. So him, he and Lizette are proud parents of uh, four children, 18 to 32, and one grandchild. The other thing that's really important to him <coughs> is his health, um, and I understand that their property was affected during those fires that came through a few years ago, so point. But I said, yeah, but what really, really is important to him? And he says, oh, I just hated how we follow America and everything. What I'd really like to see is an Australian identity around food. So with, please make him welcome, and we look forward to his presentation. Thanks, Kathy, and thanks to the Goulburn Broken Catchment Authority for inviting me. Um, we're just over the hill, only that far away. For, for those of you, of you who thought you were coming to listen to a farmer today, <laughs> um, how many farmers in the room? Uh, a little bit younger than me. Where are all the young ones? <laughs> Why wouldn't you give them the day off? We need to do this, folks. We need to have young people here. OK? For those of you who thought you wouldn't need a meat processor, that's me, because I'm also a meat processor. In our paddock-to-plate business, I make sausages. Lizette packages meat. Any meat processors in the room? Another farmer? Meat processor? Why the hell isn't any meat, aren't any meat processors here? Where's the butcher? Where's the local butcher? Okay. As we speak, our contract chef is making pies at the Broadford High School out of our beef. I know how to cook a roast. I've never done it. I tell people how to do it. Lizette's told me how to do it. I'm also an amateur chef, an amateur cook. How many chefs here today? Oh, come on. Professional chefs. One. That is dismal. We are talking about food connection with local producers. What am I doing? Preaching to the converted. Alan Snaith, amateur marketing magnate. <laughs> We've already mentioned Twitter. Our whole business runs on Twitter and Facebook. My budget is two $120 plans. Two iPhones and a computer. Well, Lizette likes computers. There's two others at home. How many people know how to use Twitter, Facebook? Not bad. Not bad for our generation. I can barely use it, but I am a voyeur, so I can read it and I can contact people on it. The, the, um, the, the title of, the, of, my original, of my original brief was Developing Local Productivity. I would like to change that to Developing Community Productivity. Local to me refers to an area, community to, to people. Your community has to back your productivity. We see it now with farmers markets that I'll get onto later. Okay? The terms of reference were four words. What, why, how and lessons. The lessons I'm leaving off because that's a whole weekend's work. The lessons are up to the individuals. The what? 
where in niche cattle, where niche cattle breeders, micro scale, right, we do paddock to plate, so I assemble them, I disassemble them, I tell people how to cook them and turn them into other things that they enjoy. Right? We work with a, a, a niche breed. Why do I do this? Originally I liked the cattle. I just liked them. My family had white face. My father's succession plan was I went to Melbourne to make, to make money to support, no sorry, bankroll the farm. So I got hooked up in Melbourne and bought a small property at Clombenane, which was a commuting distance from Melbourne. I needed cattle. I saw these. A gynaecologist friend of mine had them. He also had a Morgan that I really liked. <laughs> I thought, I'm going to get those, and I bought ten. No thought about what I was going to do with them. Along comes door to number one. This is a little bit about our history. It saves me telling everyone. But you would have already noticed shows with daughters and girls lying on cows. Daughter number one comes along, we get into showing, we get into stud genetics, we get more interested in the family, in the um, cattle rather. Daughter number two comes and follows in her path. Daughter number one, by the way, is a, is a judge of stud cattle at the moment, she's 32. Daughter, uh, daughter number three turned into son number three and he became a roadie for daughters one and two. Daughter number four comes along and she's got the main interest. Cows, as you know, double every nine months. So I have lots and lots of these wonderful belted galloways that the industrial system or the commercial cattle breeders don't like. Right? They're not popular. They're good cattle, but they're not popular. So I have to find a way of marketing my cattle. Now, my cattle are Scottish, and I'm a little bit Scottish too. So I wanted value. I sent off three or four pens early to Kite and got caned. Never do it again. Good cattle? Just not the right type for this market. 12 months production. <laughs> so we started cutting them up. and we, we st in, in 30 years ago, it was new. So we started with our local butcher and we started cutting them up. And we had a database in Melbourne of 22 families. One family, the Bellises, had three sons. They ate two and a half steers a year. They were great. Loved them. I had a Tongan customer called Rocco. He ate one steer every three months on his own. <laughs> Two more minutes? OK. So that's how we got into it. We got so large, well, large in our terms is, you know, uh, 1,000 kilograms of cut meat a week, that we couldn't use our local butcher anymore. We outgrew them. So we got a contract boning room, and to control our quality, we put on our own staff. And our own staff are working as we speak. We've got, as I said, a chef at Broadford cooking pies at the local high school. He's playing master chef. He loves it. The kids there love it. The whole involvement's good. Um, we then were launched into farmers' markets. Lansfield changed our world because our community came into it. We were exposed to 500 people on a Saturday morning at Lansfield that only had knew, known us in the past from the pony club and the football club. Ah, you're the bloke with the stripy cows, I see. Right? They kept coming back. There's now three other meat producers at Lansfield, but we've still got our original customers. We do eight markets. We balance it. We have four city markets for cash flow, and we bring that money back, and I spend it on maintaining my meat vehicles. I've just picked one up this morning in the local area. And we have four local markets, the furthest being Castle Main. And that's all we're going to do. And we have a handful of restaurants because we see restaurants as publicity. And when they put our name on the menu, they put Clombenane. Warrior of beef from Clombenane. Where the hell is Clombenane? It's the rooster tree. Ah! <laughs> I've seen the rooster tree. The rooster tree's got its own Facebook page. <laughs> it has. Look it up. Huh? Right next to the rooster tree, there's a, a ridge of black and white striped cows. Guess who's that, who they belong to? That bloke that goes to Lansfield Farmer's Market that tells me how to cook roller roasts I've never heard of before in my life. Right? Or banjo steaks. Last week we found a new cut. It's not on Osmeat. MLA don't have it listed. We have it listed. And we've talked to the chefs. As soon as I gave one to a chef on the Saturday market in at Melbourne, I got an order on Tuesday. Connection. So 
So how many acres do I have and what was the rest of it? And how do you keep it sustainable? How do I keep it sustainable? Okay, no one in this room is going to believe this, but I own 60 acres. Years and years ago I went to a beef check, I did a beef check course and the DPI told me farmers are silly. Businessmen lease factories until their businesses grow into factories. Farmers go out and buy land and end up with debt this big at the start. So that's what we do, we lease. And we run 700 acres in the Clombinane Valley with the involvement of all those local residents. There's various arrangements. We also had, prior to the big barbecue in February three years ago, we had the grazing rights on two pine plantations. Now this links to your sustainability bit. They stopped spraying because our cattle, were, they were eating all of the easements, the fire easements that are required. They had people present most days when we were checking cattle or their staff. Another big issue, vandalism and stuff like that. By leasing, my inputs are very, very low because I walk in to, I've just actually this weekend got to move cattle onto a 60 acre block that the person, he's a lifestyle person and they, she, she works in Melbourne. So I actually match the cattle to the ground I don't have ground that I have to thump cattle into. It's getting harder and harder because I compete with horses. Right. But it's, yeah. next, next question. Our meat is an MSA graded, and, but it is, I do, I've done an MSA course with a fellow called Tim Baylor, so you know. And our grass fed, I know MSA now have a grass fed set of criteria. But prior to that, we were just imposing our grass fed. So my fat colour is different because it's grass fed, it's yellow. The original MSA grading would downgrade that. But our customers ask for it. This is the funny thing. Right? Our, our meat is dry aged and dry hung. So I don't have to worry about grading boning room one, two, three, four because of the wet ageing factor. Right? Our meat colour is different because our cattle are heritage and they're older. They're slower growing. I wish I could get Belle Galloway's to grow as quick as Angus and Charolais and whatever, but they can't. <coughs> Simple as that. Are you starting work with schools? Do you, with, uh, you I'm working at the moment with NMIT, their show team. And they, they come into our meat room and they pull animals apart. The thing they can't believe is the ossification. Harry would know this ossification is bone growth. Because our animals are older, but they're slower growing, their ossification is still fine. It's, it's an amazing thing. Anyway, next question. What do you reckon a meat processor gets at a management level? Well, I get his wage, because I do it. Right? What do you reckon a, a contract chef gets? I get his wage, because I do that. We've cut out three levels, effectively. We work hard, we do 14 hour days pretty much every day, except Monday, then I do the bank and the dentist and all that sort of stuff. So it, it's a case of cutting. No agents fees. Um, sorry. Question over there. Yeah. yeah, I do. I do long hours in the truck because I have animal ethic issues. So we truck our own cattle. Um, so I actually do that because we there's only eight of us in the organisation and only two of us are full time. Was it myself? We have um, three. Three of the eight aren't local. Unfortunately, our butcher is from Melbourne, and we've got a meat packer and and a, a just put on. I suppose you call him a meat apprentice. Okay. Uh, hard lesson learnt. Well, we're learning hard lessons all the time. I think probably one of them was getting a little bit ahead of ourselves on breeding. Um, as I said, my daughters were very enthusiastic and it actually drove us into doing what we're doing. But, you know, you can get a, a little bit ahead of yourself in, uh, as far as animals to move. We've caught up a little bit now because of publicity, because of talking, because of um, the chef connection. And that's why I'm disappointed there's no chefs here. And farmers markets. Farmers markets are massive. We work our farmers markets, this is to do with sustainability too. We work our farmers markets on animals. Lancefield is a one animal farmers market. Five kilos of eye fillet goes out at Hupar State, stiff buddy. Try something different. Do you know now we come back from Lancefield with eye fillet? Because they're asking for stewing steak and they're asking for hanger steak and they're asking for roller blades. Slow food market in at Melbourne, 5,000 people through the gate on a sunny Saturday morning. That's two and a half animals. Two and a half animals is only one, um, two tails. If you want oxtail soup, get here early. 
They, but they wear it. They come up and they go, that's fantastic. What else can I try? Warrior elder beef now has six livers, four tons, because we had a bad market on the weekend. It was in Turak. No, oh, sorry, I shouldn't say that. <laughs> Gone. We had, we had two bad markets a month ago, and I said to Lizette, <clears throat> our dry age kill, which is three weeks dry age for the markets, is still there. It won't hold because we graded it on fat cover. Right, it won't hold for six weeks, which is our restaurant quality. She hit Facebook. In 15 minutes, the butcher was slicing to orders for box meat. The next day, Lizette was in the van, and Jeanette was no, Lizette was packing, and Jeanette was in the van delivering to households in Melbourne. Once off, we don't do that all the time. We're not internet marketers. We're face-to-face -face marketers. Oh, small goods are wasted. Yeah, sorry, Megan. In 2006, we were invited by the Slow Food Organisation, they're not really slow, just a few of them, <laughs> to, go, to go to Terra Madre, which is the Slow Food Convention in Turin, in Italy. And we went there with the specific purpose in mind to talk to artisan producers, small people like ourselves, and to develop a range of beef small goods. We did that and we came back, so now we do, I don't know, kilos of beef salami, dry brazola, um, air dried beef or brazola, um, chorizo, beef chorizo, all different. Most of that sort of stuff, pork. So that's what we did. So that reduces our wastage. We sell dog's bones. Our, our wastage, we do dripping, we do lard. Our wastage, yeah, our wastage on an animal, on a 370 kilo carcass that I did yesterday, was 12 kilos of sausage, no, 12 kilos of sausage trim, because we can track it all. This is how we, you know, we, we, we're hands on. Um, it was, there was no wastage on the bones. In fact, I was scratching I'm for bones. I'm stop now. I hate to do it, but you could, I think Alan could probably talk a long time about this. <laughs> so I'll just bring it to a close. Lizette, can you come up as we thank you both for a fantastic presentation? <laughs> Oh, I like it.